cool. Do we have everyone? Maybe we can start with intros as, as the last few people trickle in and you can kick it off, Timo. Yeah, um, we all know each other. Um, or I guess I know everyone here, but uh, what, how about regen people introduce themselves and then um, uh, that, that'd be, I think that'd be the most efficient. And then, and then these guys can, can connect with you on LinkedIn or Discord after you guys introduce yourself. Sorry, I'm setting up notes. Um, cool, I can kick it off. Uh, yeah, I'm Sam. I'm the registry program manager here at Regen Network. I've been working here for about a year and a half and have had quite the evolution throughout my time at the organization. Um, so I have a background in geography and computer science, uh, did a lot of uh, academic work studying landscape evolution um, using remote sensing and kind of focused on geospatial development. And so when I first got hired at Regen, I was really focused on kind of the science side of things. And over the course of the last year, my, my role has kind of evolved to act at the intersection of a lot of different pieces of our organization. So registry program design, working with methodology developers um, and folks like yourself uh, that have really unique projects in our ecosystem. Um, and then, you know, working with like people like Ryan on, um, you know, more of the data architecture and credit class design side of things and, and what that would look like on um, a digital ledger. I can go. I'm Tika Lubin. I've been with Regen for about six months and have a background in science communication, science project management. Um, so working closely with Sam on the um, on working with methodology developers, projects um, developers, and helping them engage with our community and helping kind of shepherd them through the process to take their idea and turn it into a credit. Um, so yeah, so I'm really cool. And I'm Ryan, uh, I work on the engineering team. I wear kind of multiple hats at the moment. I'm doing some developer relations work. I'm doing, helping with uh, managing some of the grant recipients. I'm uh, doing some software development work on the region ledger side. Uh, my background is working within the blockchain space for the last three or four years. Uh, I've been uh, previously uh, working on projects in the Ethereum ecosystem, a uh, DAO platform uh, project called Colony was where I started. And then I switched over to a company called Chainsafe and I was working on a implementation of Polkadot protocol. And, uh, and then I found my way to Regen Network after taking a little bit of a break and deciding that I wanted to do something more focused on uh, regeneration and the solving issues related to the climate crisis. So I've been digging in here at Regen for, I think it's been about eight months now. Um, and yeah, wearing multiple hats, but uh, working with Sam on credit class design and uh, working with the engineering team on implementation of new features. Awesome. Well, so, so we have the, the Basin team here, just in the essence of time, if, if the Basin team could just reach out to Ryan, Tika, and Sam on LinkedIn or other places, the region uh, Discord, that'd be great. Uh, I, I think when, when you guys ask questions, the Basin team asks questions, maybe they could just do a quick intro of who they are, what their, you know, what their, work, what their role is, just so you have some context. Um, but, but basically, we wanted to get together with you to, for a couple things, to explore um, the region registry in creating our own methodology or using, um, you know, Sam calls them, you know, the like modular methodologies, like figuring out how to, okay, um, from a property level, like a holistic wins, looking at the a, a, pro, a property, could be any type of property, could be anywhere in the world, any size, and looking at a holistic angle of like, how can we make this project work from, from a financial standpoint, an impact standpoint, um, a cultural standpoint, state, multi-stakeholder approach. And to us, the, the idea of the eco credits module, and I, I know the basket basketing feature was designed for something a little different, but we're thinking about using it to actually roll up eco credits at the property level is, is kind of the way we see it of like, these are the eco credits that the property can produce. We use the basket functionality in region ledger to 
roll those up and then mint a property level NFT uh, around that. And, and we can go more into details uh, surrounding that, but uh, that's basically how, how we're thinking about it. And I wanted to get the, you know, the team in here to hear it from you rather than me. And um, just kind of, you know, they can ask more technical questions and science questions as, as well. Um, so I'm not the best person to answer those. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah. How do you want to do this? Do you want to have us give kind of an overview of the registry? Do you want to start just digging into the details of your project? Well, it, it, it's up to the team. Um, I mean, a, a, an overview could be helpful, I guess. Um, I have pointed the team to docs.region.network on one of the previous calls we've had. Um, so you know, I guess maybe, yeah, just a quick overview of Ledger, registry, eco credits module, maybe you could touch on data and uh, groups module as well, because I think those will come up in the conversation. Cool. Um, sweet. I'll, I can give that and then Ryan and Tika, you could hop in um, to fill in extra details. But yeah, so our organization is focused on um, supporting regenerative finance and in financing ecological regeneration projects. And there's two components to our organization. The first is our blockchain ledger that's designed to track all information related to claims on ecological state. And so, you know, this doesn't necessarily just need to be thinking about like a monitoring report where it's like, oh, we collected this data and then we saw these changes. We use this code to produce a monitoring report. It can be a lot more broad strokes than that. Like you could, you know, host really any information, whether it's, you know, land tenureship information, uh, green bond information, like meeting notes, you know, kind of the, the whole expanse, not to just give insight into, hey, what's the information supporting this claim, but what what is the process leading up to that? And so we have, you know, projects as on-chain entities. In the future, we might have things like methodologies as on-chain entities. And then you could create metadata around that, you know, tagging your methodology in a certain way, such as, you know, uses this model or it has this degree of uncertainty. And uh, to do that, we're leveraging RDF to create knowledge graphs. And so RDF is uh, built using a series of triples. So you have subject, predicate, object. And so you could be saying like, you know, this project uses this method or this, you know, monitoring report has this level of uncertainty. And in doing that, we hope to kind of build out this, this knowledge graph supporting, you know, ecological claims. And a lot of that is gonna be launched with our data module, um, which, you know, maybe Ryan can speak to you more um, but yeah, so to, to, to close up on the, you know, the ledger side of things, we currently have our eco credit module, which is for tracking uh, credits. And these aren't just carbon credits, they could be any types of credits. So you could do biodiversity credits, you could do water quality credits, you could even use that module to um, do things like green bonds, right? And like we have retirement functionality. Um, and you know, so you could do something like you could create a green bond using, you know, the eco credit module and the retirement might be when you're redeeming that green bond for something like a, a more traditional ecosystem service credit. Um, and we also have the groups module, which will allow for governance of certain things. And this isn't necessarily, you know, token holder governance. It's just having a region address. You can create groups um, which have the ability to self-organize and vote on certain processes. So it really supports kind of like DAO organization and project level organization. And so on the other side of our organization, we have the regen registry, which is, um, used to help guide people through the process of developing projects, methodologies, um, and other actions that, or other land management interventions that result in ecological change. And so in traditional registry programs like Vera or Gold Standard, uh, they have a very strict set of requirements for how you have to you know, engage with their registry program. So you have to have your methodology be ISO certified in a certain way, you know, peer reviewed in a certain way using their set of peer reviewers. When you run a project, you can only use certain project proponents. You have to have a verifier come in and do it in a very specific way. And our program is structured differently in that 
we've opened it up quite a bit. And the program itself is more kind of the guidelines and the frameworks people can apply to their projects. So for instance, we have a methodology peer review or methodology review you know, section in our program guide. And if you choose to not use that, that's fine. Um, but it's there for people to apply. And how we're approaching kind of the legitimacy piece is leveraging things like tagging to tag certain projects with uh, pieces of information on the processes they went through to get there. So if you don't have a peer reviewed methodology, sure, like that's fine, but it just might be tagged in a way that like, hey, this didn't get peer reviewed. But if you went through a more rigorous peer review process through the Regen Registry program, you could get that Regen Registry peer review tag. And you can apply that concept to a bunch of other, you know, things like digitally signing, you know, like the, the data, right? So if data is uploaded, um, someone could attest to the presence of that data and its legitimacy, um, or like monitoring reports, things of that nature. And yeah, I think that's all I really have. I don't know, Tika or Ryan, if you want to fill in on pieces I missed. Yeah, I mean, I could I could go into more detail on particular the particular modules if that's of interest. Uh, either ego credit group module or data module. Maybe it would be best to handle that with questions. But um, yeah, the other alternative would be to talk a little bit about the basket. Uh, functionality as that's something that you're interested in. Um, but as far as like overview introductions, I think that Sam did a great job in terms of providing a quick overview. So I'm happy to go into detail on any, any particular items you guys are interested in talking about. So, so one of the main things was to get the Basin team in here to ask questions and just maybe we should just see what's, what emerges. Um, yeah, so Chase, Tommy, Neil, I mean, Will, Hunter, Jeff, Justin, Steve, <laughs> whoever wants to go, just like fire away, and uh, we'll just see see where it goes. I guess I'm I'm curious what context you guys have on Basin in general, because um, I'm I'm definitely interested in digging into this as as it relates specifically to to our goals. Um, so, so we can either give a background on Basin if if you're not super familiar with with our plans. Um, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts there, Ryan? I personally could use a little bit of background on Base and Dow. I haven't been involved in these conversations as much, and I've been following Timo, but uh, I haven't actually gotten a, quite an uh, overview aside from, yeah, information I've picked up through Twitter. <laughs> so. uh, cool. So, <clears throat> at, at a high level, our our goal is to you know, acquire natural capital assets. Um, and quantify the, the, the measurable characteristics about them from an ecological perspective, whether that's the biodiversity, the carbon sequestration potential, uh, so on and so forth. Um, we've seen region and region legend and the eco credits module in particular as a potentially fertile avenue for for exploration with regards to putting this this data on chain um, and you know contributing it to a treasury of the these natural capital assets um, so you know we're looking at evaluating properties um, uh, potentially applying some of the methodologies that sam discussed this earlier um, and and generating either baskets or credits. Um, I, I think this is this is sort of where a lot of my questions are, at least, uh, is with regards or as to what it looks like to go from you know we go out and acquire a property, whether that's a pristine forest somewhere or whether it's a some sort of degraded land that we plan to regenerate. Um, or really any type of property that has this value from an ecological perspective. Um, and how we take that and go from property to some sort of on-chain representation of the value there. Um, and we, you know, we have a variety of, of plans down, down the line um, with, with regards to how we manage and manage the stewardship of these, these assets. Um, but, at, at a high level, does that give a good sense of, of our plans? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, 
Thanks. Go so, ahead, Tika. Is, uh, so when you're looking at these lands, is the potential to generate something on chain the priority as far as evaluating if you want to acquire the asset or not? Or are there other things that you're looking at? Um, Timo, I'm not sure if you want to answer that. I can, I can give my perspective. Yeah, then go, go for it. else yeah. can, can jump in. Um, I mean, I, I think that the measure, the measurability of aspects of the land is important to us. Um, but what that methodology looks like in particular is, is I think, up for debate. Uh, and and I, I do think that, generally speaking, the pipeline of sort of like evaluating a property, you've from all of these, these different angles, those like biodiversity, the water, carbon and sequestration potential. Um, I think though, like to the extent that those are inputs to this sort of, this, this region ledger eco credit module, um, I, I think that's compelling, um, but I don't think that's the sole factor here. Um, so I'm, I'm not the, the property guy on the team. So anyone else can feel free to chime in here. So I, mean, I, I yeah, guess I my question building off Tika's is like, it, it sounded to me is just like, are you guys doing a pre-evaluation for acquiring the property, right? So, you know, that, that would likely happen before you land anything on the ledger. Correct, yeah. So like one of the goals we're tasked with is basically like given a certain property, we have to evaluate its, um, you know, its role in the whole basin ecosystem. And so one of those is, are we gonna be able to generate Revenue off that property by issuing credits for it, or you know, other other sorts of ways we can we can monetize it. Um, in addition to like all the non monetizable things that we find important, but I think a big part of that question is you know what is available there that can be issued as credits. So obviously, carbon's the like the biggest one, but then all these other ecosystem services like biodiversity or water water quality or water quantity um, are super valuable. We like it's kind of a newish field. So getting some ideas around how regen is seeing those credits valued, how those credits, like the evolution of those credit types over time or like what we think might be um, there for us to kind of score in the future is something I'm interested in. Yeah, I guess I was kind of wondering if you already had evaluation tools in place that you're using. I was curious about what those are and if those had a place as, uh, you know, something for us to consider. And, you know, you might be using tools that you don't even know could be considered in a evaluation of a credit kind of a thing, like social welfare or things like that that we're looking at. So that's kind of what I was curious about. So, so Tika, some of the, the members here on the group, it, it stemmed out of a, a climate sprint we did this summer. And we came up with this label called the core uh -huh. benefits label, uh, which is like a quick assessment tool, like a holistic uh, tool for approaching climate projects and and Tommy and Neil on the call they they've formed a uh, advisory company that's basically around uh, that tool we came up with so Basin's kind of using it for a real estate lens Tommy and Neil are, are using it for and, and their team are using it for like if, you know Neil if you want to expand on that go, go ahead sure um, we are uh, we're we're a services company that is trying to uh, uh, shepherd more projects through to completion by doing holistic high-level evaluations of ecosystem services um, across projects, companies, et cetera. We have a process that we take folks through that results in an intuitive deliverable that allows them to rapidly sort of assess the value of their project from a variety of subcategories within environmental, social, uh, economic, and financial uh, domains. Uh, the environmental domain is very well fleshed out, so it includes things like water, air, biodiversity and all many subcategories below that, right down to the level of actually being able to measure like above ground biomass or acre, acre feet of water, you know, millions of, uh, millions of acre feet of water aquifer recharge levels or whatever, all of those things can be embedded into this evaluation model and then reflected back to project developers to aid in that decision-making process. We're not a verifier. We're not going through and establishing ground truth for people. What we're doing is providing this decision framework that allows them to go through and evaluate all the ways in which their uh, their property, their company, their investment, 
could have these these impact categories and then um, and then get them a decision making and decision support tool back that basically allows them to go through and say we have a target opportunity here we have a risk over here right we're a direct air capture company we use a ton of power that's kind of a, against us but you know in our favor we're sequestering a ton of carbon for basin it'll look like here's a property that's been degraded um, it has the potential to sequester a lot of carbon because it's effectively starting at zero, but maybe you have some remediation risk associated with the fact that, right, it used to be a brown field or something else. So the, being able to see that in a single place and have a decision support framework is kind of what, what we're all about. It's an evaluation tool uh, for Basin that could be, could be helpful. Um, I think it's an interesting point to your question, and I don't know if this is a question you're asking, and I'm, I guess I have to ask a question about the question you're asking, which is, um, are you asking whether or not Basin is trying to do ecosystem service price discovery on chain or not? Is that kind of what underlies your question? Because I do think there's elements of each. I mean, I don't know that we have a nice, neat tie today for, I mean, take, you know, agricultural lands in Eastern Washington, 6.4 million acre feet of water sequestered into aquifers. There's a capacity for some amount of land out there to achieve that level. And that's significant for farmers in Eastern Washington. Do we have a really neat way to tie that to a dollar amount of value instrument? Um, I don't know that we do today. Um, and so I do think there's an element of price discovery there when you place these, these things like aquifer recharge or stormwater detention or flood. Those are just the water ones. You can go through air, you can go through biodiversity place them on chain as a way of doing price discovery, direct price discovery on those services, because not all of them have explicit prices assigned today. So that's there. Sorry, I asked a question that went off. What, are we, is the question about whether or not we're doing price discovery on chain? Is that what we're trying to get at? Uh, yeah, or, or, if the, you, or if you had additional tools that you were using as metrics to decide if you wanted to buy a piece of land. And it sounds like from the chat that you haven't purchased any lands. This is all still in development. So yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. I, I yep. mean, I would argue that like region marketplace is where that price discovery is happening, right? Like we're developing an order book model that allows buy orders and sell orders to um, allow for price discovery. So it's more like once you guys have produced those assets, um, you know, maybe like pilot assets, then that price discovery could happen and then be used yep. as a tool to retroactively inform or inform future project development. Right. Yeah, a big part of the registry program is, uh, you know, value through transparency. So if we have everybody sharing their processes and their methods and it's transparent, number one, people can decide what a value how much value something has. Number two, it allows people to collaborate with each other who may be building the same tools or similar tools um, or have a tool and apply it somewhere else. So. so evaluation, yes. Explicit price discovery, no. Uh, explicit ground truth on ecosystem services, no. That's that's uh, that's my answer for what Valis provides to Basin Dow. Yeah, and, and then and then so taking a step further, that we're going to have to work with other groups or project managers, you know, on the ground to do MRV, you know, to actually support these claims. So that's that's kind of the next step. We're like like Chase said in the in the chat, we're looking, we're we're creating like a quick and dirty assessment tool, and the, the core benefits label is part of that. We're looking at geospatial stuff. We're looking at any other, you know, like open source mapping tools. Uh, we're looking at even creating an algorithm that helps like aggregate, like, okay, who are the motivated sellers? Where are the properties the cheapest? What is the biodiversity overlay? And to kind of like, auto eventually we'd hope to automate that process where we can look at a hundred properties a week and then narrow them down and then make offers and then, then do due diligence, then buy, then do all the stuff on the property that we need to either uh, restore or conserve or operate to then mint these eco credits. And then you know, taking it a step further is like the other things that the, the properties provide, like, like use agreements, other, other things that maybe, you know, and probably won't be in eco credits, like oil and gas rights. Like we're looking at like a mechanism to actually keep that in the ground and use 
refi practices to actually say, okay, who would pay us to keep it in the ground or what kind of tax deductions can we use to donate those mineral rights away so that the wells get capped and that, that oil and natural gas is never coming out of the ground. Um, I, I'd also like to know like where, where social impact tokens might land in the region ecosystem. I mean, I'm tracking what ICSO is doing, for example, but we're, we're trying not to complicate it, you know, overly complicate with something that's already complicated. So like, do we have to go to ICSO or somewhere else to do social impact tokens or will social impact be part of region ledger um, is another que outstanding question I have. I mean, I, I would say like social impact is like a pretty broad, like that's a pretty broad statement, right? Um, Cause like social impact could be like a co-benefit tied to a project, right? You know, a lot of the Amazonian projects that we're working with are really focused on community development. So to creating like social programs to support, you know, women's groups or community development, providing resources, not in a financial way, but developing like solar panel projects. So that's like one form of, you know, kind of social impact, but then you could also get into reputation and social impact in contributing to projects. So like, what are the reputations associated with contributing to a methodology or engaging in peer review or providing monitoring services? Um, I, I know that doesn't answer your question, but uh, I think that there's a lot to unpack there. If you had a more specific idea. I mean, I mean, do you okay. think Sam, or I mean, do you think that social <laughs> impact is going to stay on or you know be created in region or is that something we should talk to ixo about? I, I think it will be i think that that's a lot of the work that the foundation is working on with digital identities um and that's also something that we hope to nest in the registry program you know over time is just creating kind of on-chain digital identities where you could kind of like say who you are you know what you're doing what projects you're involved in and tying in like projects like source cred to kind of evaluate, you know, contribution scores or other sort of scores for engaging or your your impact. And we also have our like de gender regen idea that Ned is working on. Can you unpack that, the de gender regen? Uh, yeah, the idea is to evaluate your degenerative footprint in a more holistic way. Um, and then offset that not with carbon credits, but, uh, you know, other ways like, you know, environmental stewardship credits, contribution credits, data collection, badges, things like that. Okay, so, so that would be the, the practice based methodology that's now now being called uh, environmental stewardship. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's an element of it. I, I think that's something to unpack too for everyone is, is like that the two di the differences between outcome based and in practice based and, and kind of what your thoughts are there or what, what you think is going to happen or how, you know kind of how you see those playing out um yeah i mean i think a lot of it is rooted in just like carbon markets are flawed you know like carbon is a great way to finance projects and a lot of in a lot of times it makes sense but like carbon is just a single indicator in a more you know, like, like ecological regeneration isn't carbon sequestration and carbon isn't always being sequestered. And if you even look at soil carbon specifically, like there's a lot of debate over soil carbon permanence and storage. And like, if that's actually going to play out in the long run, because you could get a drought and that could totally zap soil carbon <coughs> because soil microbes are dependent on water. And, um, you know, there are a lot of projects that are trying to package environmental stewardship into a carbon credit, but that just doesn't really make sense. And so, you know, the other side of the coin here is that carbon markets are extremely difficult to engage with in a more traditional sense, right? Like Vera Gold Standard are doing great work, but they're super prohibitive in their, you know, financial barriers and like programmatic barriers. Like if you're operating in Cambodia, the chances that a, you're going to have the financial resources to engage in that project and B, get like the appropriate human resources to help you develop the project in that area is like costly and, and difficult. And so the idea of the, the environmental stewardship approach is like, let's seed finance projects, figure out what makes sense to measure if that's carbon or something otherwise, reward good data collection and, and then develop credits over time, which to me, it seems like the, that's the kind of approach that you guys are taking, right? With the, the core benefits is doing an early assessment and then 
there's a there's Absolutely, a common yeah. there's a common thread here that I want to highlight that I think this kind of it might be taking a little bit of a step back, but like ultimately what was said so far is uh, Basin seeks to acquire land as part and as part of that acquisition we need to assess uh, uh, what can happen with it, right? So there's a <clears throat> a set of processes that aren't quite defined yet. Regen has this great history and community around um, methodologies. And I think that's the first intersection point that we're talking about here. Uh, I've read some of your methodologies, especially around agriculture, but I'm imagining you have more. And so one question I have is how can we tap into your methodologies and how can we also not just be takers, but contribute to that ecosystem in some way? Um, <clears throat> uh, because those it's those methodologies that help us understand how we would actually turn a piece of land into something that is of quote quote value in um, in these in these markets, especially I'm thinking of carbon markets right now, right? <clears throat> um, and two, once we start to understand those methodologies that you all have worked on uh, and are so great to share, and I love that by the way, um, uh, uh, that opens up the actual practical implementation strategy for how to build out a, a chain, right? Because I think the combina combination of your eco credits, the data module, module, which is under heavy development right now, so we don't fully know what that's gonna look like in a month or two, right? Um, we think we do, but you know, software is. Um, um, and, uh, and then this basketing functionality, all of this, like I'm not terribly worried about the implementation details of the regen ledger. What I'm more curious about right now is how do these methodologies and our goals filter into that choke point, which is, uh, which is then knowing what we're going to monitor or uh, what we're going to um, purchase based, based off of what we can monitor because monitoring translates into the ultimate goal. And just one caveat to that, when you, for everyone to be aware of, and I'm sorry if this is redundant, monitoring is sometimes very labor intensive and sometimes very time horizon intensive. Like restoring agricultural land for, um, or like a, a ranch, ranching land, like cattle land, uh, according to the methodologies I read from Regen, that's a 10 year time horizon. So I just want us to understand that we really need to digest these methodologies to think about the scale of a marketplace uh, traction. Hopefully that wasn't too much. Kind of set six in my head's all swirling. <laughs> Is that helpful to this conversation? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, that and was, that was... And, Sam, and Sam, do you think I'm accurate by saying, by like not being too worried about the implementation of the chain? Uh, I want to. No, I, I mean, I think that was spot on. I think that what I was thinking about earlier is just like mm. the amount of like heavy science lifting that has to go into this kind of work, right? Especially if you guys are going to be acquiring properties in a variety of different ecosystems, right? Like mine, like doing a mine reclamation project is extremely different than doing a regenerative grazing project or even doing an agroforestry project in the Pacific Northwest is different than what it would look like in the pantropics, like if you're do doing it in Brazil or Ecuador. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's just like a lot of heavy science lifting and, and maybe it's not important to think about right now, what's the methodology going to be to measure the change once we implement the practice, but how can we focus on evaluating the current state of the landscape, seeing which regenerative practices apply, and then working with the community with developed methodologies or undeveloped methodologies to um, you know, help people engage in those projects? I think that's exactly right. And really, this practical implementation is what I'm most interested in, is sort of if given a set of pilot properties, for example. How do we get from property, evaluate the current state of the land, and, and turn that into something that uses this, this data module? Um, I, I, I think that's 
the, the most interesting thing for me, at least. And I think that, Justin, that's what you were alluding to as well. I have a question real quick. Like, to what extent can the eco credit values be regionally based or tied to different geographies? Because like you said, so different in the Northwest uh, than in the, the tropics. So yeah, that's a good question. And probably work? something that our colleague Sarah Baxendale would be a little <laughs> bit more apt to uh, talk with you about because she's doing a lot of the, the heavy lifting on a you know kind of business development partnership and working with the marketplace and, and buyers. Um, but you know, from speaking with her, it sounds like on the buy side of things, people are looking for very specific credits and a lot of their just high level filters are location and methodology. And so people could say, Hey, they're like, we're just looking for, you know, credits from 2016 onward in Australia. And they're really excited about Australian credits. So I, I would say that it does have a pretty big impact on, um, you know, buyer preference. Were those two examples just examples or, or were those real, like those are the top metrics, location and methodology? Um, those are some of, from my conversations with Sarah B, it sounds like those are some of the mm. bigger preferences at this point is just vintage year <laughs> methodology and location. Um, can you help me? So like with methodology, uh, that can, a true methodology for land practice can very wildly, right? Like in terms of what actually happens on the ground. But in what you just said, is that kind of like a, a general methodology, like um, forest restoration or soil restoration on cattle land? Is that what you mean by methodology? I'm trying to understand precisely what you mean. Yeah, just like a methodology is, mm. you know, broadly speaking, measuring ecological change. So taking a set of ecological indicators and saying, because of this land management practice, we're going to, like, we're going to measure, you know, this, these, you know, environmental or social indicators and then see what that change is. But oftentimes it does, you know, you could develop a carbon plus agroforestry methodology, but and it might have the same core indicator of let's say carbon, but you do have to tailor that methodology specifically to the region you're working in sometimes. You know, with grasslands, it's a lot easier because you're just measuring soil carbon. But if you're thinking about trees, right? Like you need to be using allometric equations, which measure carbons in trees. And allometric equations are very species specific um, and climate specific. So the amount of rain, the temperature, the species typically plays into the carbon sequestered by that tree. And so you could create a very broad strokes methodology, but just it in some ways it does have to be region specific. So that, you that see, all makes Are you seeing demand sorry. for those le that level of features? What do you mean? All these different ways to differentiate value, right? Uh, so it's a land project. Well, it's this slice, it's this color of land project. Well, it's the specific kind of that color of land project in this specific region with these specific species. Are, are, are people looking to, to you to support a robust <coughs> taxonomy and feature set that allows them to differentiate one from another? Um, again, I think this is a question for for Sarah B. Um, Great. Great. Maybe the buy side, but I, I mean, yes, like I would say so. Mm. As, as someone that's building an MR solution, you kind of need that data to have it be accurate because oak is very different from like a tree in, in the Amazon rainforest. So they have very different properties, which end up um, you know, limiting the amount of carbon that can be sequestered. So, so setting aside like the the <coughs> sort of regional and ecosystem specific questions here, um, I, I'd I'd like to like imagine I we have a specific property in 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 whatever region, and we conduct whatever or specific MRV we need to to do, um, we use whatever methodology, um, and output a certain data set. What does the process look like from that point onwards with, with regards to, to region? Because um, I, I think methodology is something that, as you pointed out, has a lot of nuance here. But is there a point where there is like a clear methodology that region and ha has developed to go from data set to on-chain in credit? 
Yeah, and that's a pretty like a pretty deep process. I mean, there's you know the methodology. Like, let, let's just assume that a methodology already exists, right? Um, so typically, what that looks like is you know doing a project plan uh, where you're saying this is our land management intervention. This is the the time zone. Here are the different actors involved. You'd establish a project plan, get the appropriate stakeholders to sign that, register it with Regen Registry, and then from there you'd be establishing something like a baseline. Um, taking that baseline monitoring report. Um, you know, there's contracts with monitoring service providers. So maybe you guys are working with Chase as your monitoring service pro provider and you make agreements um, between you guys. There's also thinking about the community, which is a really important and sometimes overlooked aspect of, you know, if you're a project developer, are you the landowner? Like, like what sort of agreements are you making with the land stewards, whether it's an indigenous group, whether it's someone, you know, farmer that you're representing and, and what agreements are there in place. So there's a lot of legal structure that goes into this, but, you know, from there, let's say you develop your monitoring report in traditional systems, you'd want verification, um, which, you know, we're still encouraging. Maybe that's not a hundred thousand dollar ISO certified verifier coming in. Maybe it's more of a desk audit or you find a creative solution there. Um, but it would go through a verification process. And then this is where it comes into your credit class design and setting the parameters by which you think well, what the boxes, what boxes need to be checked for you guys to issue credits, right? So do you have the monitoring report? Did it go through verification? Are there other steps involved that would need to trigger that credit issuance? Because Regen Registry isn't really aiming to take on too much of you know, that we're not the gatekeepers, so to speak, of being able to issue people's credits. We're happy to work with people that, you know, might not want to do that themselves, but we're more providing the platform and the structures by which you guys can be successful in designing your own program. Um, and so you have to be very meticulous in the way that you design your credit class such that it has, you know, the legitimacy and rigor um, that proves that you guys really did the, the work to create a high, high quality ecological asset. Okay, so just to just to clarify here, it, it seems like it's really a process that's defined by us, and this this credit class module is something that we define as we choose, um, and that needs to be backed by rigorous real world methodology. Um, but but Regen more provides the rails for this rather than defining okay to produce a credit class with these characteristics, you need to have these inputs. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That, that's super helpful. Um, yeah. yeah, and just kind of talking on the technical side a little bit too, like in relation to like, okay, so you create this credit class and then you're going to issue batches from this credit class. And then once that batch has been issued, you, you have a certain number of credits that are out there and you can sit, like sell these credits in like a storefront model where essentially you're setting the ask price and you're looking for buyers for those credits, or you can use the basket functionality, which would allow you to pool these credits into a basket um, alongside other credits of similar value and then create like a redeemable token for that. And like the same way that the Toucan protocol uses like uh, a base carbon ton credit as well as they're uh, working on their nature-based uh, nature based base carbon ton uh, token as well. And these are like pooled assets that all have like, uh, in terms of price discovery are being grouped together based on certain criteria. And so what Regen's providing is like this kind of like full framework for you to be able to one, go through the methodology development process, but then also like be able to create these credit classes, cr issue these batches, find like uh, a price, like go through price discovery um, and be able to like leverage all of these tools um, kind of without retail network controlling, like Sam said, we're not trying to be the gatekeepers in this situation. We're trying to provide all the tools for you to be able to successfully go through this process and um, find buyers. Right, and to the extent that these batches that we issue off of off of the credit classes have value, they have value because is that they are backed by Bateson's methodology and reputation and et cetera, et cetera. Correct, and so you like building your reputation within the space as well. So like um, there there are, there's going to be like 
right, right now we're permission approach. So basically Regen Registry is the only one that's able to issue credits at the moment. But the idea is to go permissionless. This was part of like a, a migration path for us in terms of like some technical nuances that we needed to sort out. But um, basically, yeah, it's gonna become permissionless. So anyone can create credit classes on Regen Ledger. So there's gonna be need, a need for reputation backed by this. And we are creating, another, I don't know if it's going to land in this next upgrade, but we're creating something called like curation tags, where essentially you could be like a curator of different credits and like tag things and give it a rating so that you can like be a reputable source. So different, um, different credit classes could be approved by like Regen Registry or by Basin DAO as like having gone through this peer review process in terms of like a legitimate methodology and um, so there's, there's like, yeah, there's lots of nuances in terms of trying to get all these pieces working together, but. Um, For my own edification, is it basically a TCR? Yeah, it, 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 yeah maybe. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Ryan, like, maybe this is a nuanced question, but like, in terms of the baskets, how have you seen people so far grouping those assets into a basket? Because I can imagine that could go all sorts of ways, including dumping lots of low quality credits into the mix, which may or may not be something someone wants to buy. And given what right. I said so far about the, the detail that's needed to understand how, that buyers want to understand, I'm imagining that plays in as well. Yeah, so <laughs> the baskets is completely in development. No one is actually using it oh, at okay. the moment, um, but we mm -hmm. do have a specification written out and we like, Sam's kind of touched on some of the key components that would define a basket and um, those specific filter criteria, um, they, so like you can group by credit type. So like if it's a carbon credit type, biodiversity credit type, soil health, um, all these different credit types, you do like credit class, which is focused on the methodology. You can do by project location, you do batch start and end dates. And so basically you're creating these pools based on this particular set of like filter criteria or basket criteria defined by these pools. And so the idea is then also um, in order to prevent like arbitrage situation, it's a first in first out uh, model. So basically if, if you're gonna create this basket, you're gonna pull all these credits together. Um, you're gonna receive a redeemable token. That's something that you can trade as like an ERC 20 token or uh, a standard token. Um, or you could redeem, uh, you could, like, if you're going to want to offset, you can like put that token back and get the first, uh, or yeah, the oldest credit that was put into that basket and you could redeem it and retire it. And the idea of being that all of these credits are um, built into this criteria. So they're, they're, uh, yeah, they're the same value essentially. And so that people are, they have a token that they can then swap and trade and participate in uh, liquidity pools and things like that with, um, that's much more, yeah, versatile than like our current credit batch, which is something that uh, is, yeah, it's not necessarily a token that people can trade around. So, um, but then they can also like put it back in, uh, redeem credits from the basket uh, using this token and on a first in first out basis. Is the choice to pool uh, done by batch? In other words, does any given batch, is it either destined for pool or not? Is that kind of a binary? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I totally understand. So well, like if, we, do a, we do a batch of credits that we issue and that, you know, we do people say, I just issued these credits. I want to pool all of them, or I just want to pool these, and then I want these other ones to remain completely untethered and not not pooled with other, not thrown in a basket with others. Can you mix and match, or when you do a when you do a credit issuance as a batch, do you have to I kind of like decide? Yeah, the the basket criteria. If if the the batches fall within the basket criteria, they can be placed within the basket. So uh, there's you 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 can't define specifically particular batches that you want to fit the criteria. But if it does follow the like credit type, credit class, project location, start and end date, then uh, if it meets that criteria, it can be placed within the basket to Got receive it. this redeemable token. Yeah. The, the batches themselves are issued via vintages, right? So you might do a monitoring report for a specific year. Exactly. You would have that verified, and then you would determine the number of credits that you're going to be issuing to that project for that year. 
right? So, you know, you, you don't want to just mint batches willy nilly. It, it's usually tied to kind of just like a specific event of like, hey, we right. did this monitoring report. Here's our data to show for it. And we issue them in a batch. And then when you issue in a batch, you can issue in a retired state, you can issue to a single address, you can issue to multiple addresses. You know, you guys could issue to the land steward themselves and then they can decide on how they want to do it or, you know, so on and so forth. Sure. sure. So, and then, so going back to Jeff's question earlier, it sounds like we could uh, buy a, a, a chunk of land in a relatively specific geography that co covers a diversity of approaches and potentially batch those all into one um, geography specific multi multi uh, uh, management approach. Sounds kind of neat. So. Yeah, and um, also like what Sam was saying earlier too, in terms of like location playing a like key role, like an agroforestry mm. project in one part of the world versus one in the other and having those be able to be separate and have their own like price discovery by using this basket criteria. So um, I don't know, that wasn't entirely related, but. <laughs> okay. And Chase had a question in the chat. I wanna make sure that gets uh, <coughs> answered. It's a very, yeah, it's just a very kind of basic question. Like if we wanted to like implement something today, like what, what credits would be available to us on their region, on, on the registry? Um, I think you, you mentioned carbon, obviously biodiversity and water. Um, are, are those like the three main buckets that we're looking at or are people bringing more into the um, registry? So a lot of the credits so there's methodology and credit type, right? So in credit type is an on-chain parameter that defines the quantification metric for a certain like ecological indicator. So carbon, you know, like tons of CO2 equivalent is the, the credit type. Or um, for biodiversity, we have one that's gonna be developed that is um, hectares of protected land for protecting flagship species. And so that, the, you know, the hectares of protected land uh, might be their credit type. And so in terms of, and, and so that's credit type, but then it's, I think for you, it's more of the methodologies that are gonna be deployed. And so the methodologies that will probably be available by Q3 would be um, a biodiversity credit protecting uh, flagship species and monitoring, um, ecological change associated with protection of that species. I think there's gonna be a pollinator credit. There's gonna be hopefully a, a first draft of an agroforestry for pantropical ecosystems, which can be adapted. There's gonna be a organic sustainable fishing credit for blue carbon. Um, probably an above ground biomass measurement tool, which is not necessary. It's like, um, it's a, methodology for measuring above ground biomass that can be applied to certain regions. Um, there's going to be a practice-based credit focused on regenerative grazing in vineyard ecosystems that could likely be adapted. I don't know, Tika, do you know of anyone else that probably will be done by, you know, mid-summer? Mangroves. Mangrove uh, reforestation. Yeah. Is there anyone managing the taxonomy of these of these credit types in the sense that like you just mentioned uh you just mentioned above ground biomass which can be measured like a lot of places all the places where there's ground basically and biomass and then you mentioned vineyard specific grazing practices i'm like wow we, I, we just went from anywhere on earth to only the places where cows eat grass between grapevines like it like how does that how do you keep that all straight yeah, we're, I think Sam just put a link in the chat and then oh, we're sweet. doing great. Like, great. And I think, you know, also to what Justin said before about like, how do, how do we see the methodologies that are in development, what you guys are doing, how do we learn from those? So we're right now, like today, <laughs> launching more of an external roadmap that's going to show all the projects. So you can click on, you can go to this notion page and you can click on the project and you can see a project description, team members, who they're working with, who their monitoring service provider is, anything anything that they want to have public, they'll put on this page. So you can go in and see all of our projects, a brief description of them, 
who's working with them. Um, and we're, we're building this out. So, and then you can reach out to them. So a big part of the registry program is connection and, um, and modeling for other people to see how to engage. Um, so yeah, this is what we <laughs> Tika, can we, can we access that region registry page yet? Or is that just private? No, that's public. Yeah. Where it's being built, so it's, there's it's not, not a whole lot on it yet. Yeah, I don't think. So it will be. I don't know next week, Sam. I we'll guess we could that. we could probably make it public. We were waiting until people actually populated their cards, but I guess there's no. Yeah, and I um, I just sent out card invites the other day to project developers. We just finished the seminar. Just finished the template for the base go. So, Is there another? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so we'll be sure to share that with you guys. Yeah. Is there another channel to tap into this, like a, a specific channel on Discord or something? Because I imagine there's going to be a lot of discussion around this in general outside of. You know, um. Yeah, we're working on that. I mean, I think that you know historically, just <laughs> I feel like we're all in the Web three space, so it's like working in public. Like, let's use Discord and Twitter is just you know embedded in kind of what we do. But a lot of the folks we're working with aren't used to using those platforms, and so we're working and kind of migrating them over to start communicating more there. Um, but that being said, they're all very open to just having meetings and you know having email threads or things like that. And one thing we're also gonna be trying to do is leveraging platforms like Hilo, um, such that people can create their own groups and have kind of a mini page where, as opposed to this, where it's you know kind of advertising the project and, and giving an overview, that could be a place that you have ongoing conversations, set up meetings, store information, things like that. Yeah, or put questions out, hey, I need, help with this, anybody have any idea how to do it? And somebody can put in their chat, yeah, I've done that or. Okay, so it sounds like for the nitty gritty, there'll be a combination of Discord and this high level platform. Yeah. <clears throat> this is great. Yeah, and I mean, <clears throat> like you guys should all make these cards, you know, whether it's for Basin Dow, your pilot projects, um, you know, we've talked to Chase about having a, you know, ones for monitoring service providers and people developing tools. So, by Chase. Yeah. <laughs> Any guys uh, invite to get you started with that? I, I mean, with everything we talked about, would it make sense for Basin to try and create our own methodology or like a holistic approach, like a property specific approach? And we can pull in other methodologies as needed or you know build off those but like does it make sense you know for us to try and do that you know i think might be cool is uh taking well if it makes sense on some of the land we find like uh, taking some of those established methodologies and kind of uh inheriting them and kind of building a a, a, a kind of this basin land approach around it because i'm assuming there will be overlap a, a lot where the land might be just simply forest regeneration right and so how can we take that and then extend it to uh, to, uh, um, <clears throat> to, to some of the factors we're thinking of? <clears throat> yeah, that's Sorry. definitely the idea is that people don't have to start to, from ground zero, that they can mm -hmm. look at some of these other models and say, oh, I'm you know, working in this ecosystem, but it's got a lot of similarities um, to that other one and I can pull from that and I can reach out to those people and find out what they did. Are these um, like fairly versions? So like if we say, like I think that was the case with the agricultural one I read was we could say, yes, this project inherits the methodologies from this document version 1.3 or something. Is that? Do you want to say that question one more time? Sorry. A, we'll talk about it another time. I, I'm getting into the nitty gritty of. I have a higher level question. <laughs> Is anyone currently on Regen mm -hmm. Network combining in a token the notion of equity with the notion of an ecosystem service? Good question. Like by this token, you're getting the ecosystem service, you're also getting equity in a piece of property or equity in a company or equity in a. Is anyone munging those two no i've, I've okay. heard ideas and i'm not going to say what those are but 
I would say none, none have been fully developed. So no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. About like a mitigation token for flood or fire. No, but that'd be sweet. My dream back when I was doing science work was to develop a fire uh, resilience credit. Yeah, or a recreational last. recreational value module. Uh, a lot of land that's private that I've been looking at so far that has a lot of biodiversity in the US in the Southeast and it's all marketed as hunting land. Well, I think it's important to remember. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that'd be great. I, as far as I know, you can't develop projects on federal land without. Approval. No, these are private lands. Okay, private lands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know, Sam, if you're aware, but if you haven't looked at the Oasis loss modeling framework before um, that's used by the insurance <laughs> industry, uh, it's a super interesting uh, look at how actual effectively actuarial tables and models are built for mass catastrophes uh particularly those like that we talk about in, in in with climate change so you know big forest fires uh systemic drought uh wind wind events stuff like that it's it's uh it's an interesting well just to get it get at the value the hard value associated with flood mitigation and fire if you're trying to get calculate a value at risk there's people out there doing deep, deep calculation on that type of stuff. Sweet, I'll check this out. Yeah, it goes deep, man. It goes real deep. It's super interesting. Well, um, we're five past. Um, I don't know what you guys see as kind of appropriate next steps. I feel like could we, could we I, I mean, I, I'd propose Maybe next week we can see if Sarah could join us. I mean, I, yeah. I know Sam and Tika, you know Tika, Ryan. You guys figure out who, you know, wants to sit through this again. But I'd, I'd love to just continue this next week. If I, mean, I think yeah, there's I still connect, more questions. I would connect with Sarah on kind of the marketplace design, and she knows a lot more about kind of the token economics behind certain things and what's moving uh, with like buyers and liquidity pools and things like that. Um, because my calendar is crazy, I might skip out on that one. But, you know, if we want to have kind of a, a science specific or, or more scoping conversations on what kind of tooling you develop, like what methodologies you're developing and, and kind of the general approach, I'd be pretty excited about that because I think I have some ideas given all this context. Okay. Awesome. Well, well thank you, everybody. It's been super helpful. Good to meet you. Yeah, all. thank you. It's been great to join. Taking the time. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. See you guys online. Thank See you. Bye-bye. <laughs>